Hey, Joe from Kungwax here today talking to you about Jamstack, which is a front-end focused methodology for building web apps that has recently caught my attention. I'm going to show you what the Jamstack is, tell you why it's gaining popularity, and then I'm going to tell you what it means for back-end focused developers. Now, I consider myself to be a full-stack developer. I like being able to work with both front-end and back-end code in order to completely solve a problem. However, I do have a preference for back-end work because back-end work tends to be a bit more formal and regimented and the front-end just changes so fast and evolves so fast that it's difficult to hang on to. But despite my preferences, I'm here to solve problems and I want my solutions to be the best. In order to do that, I have to pay attention to the major trends in software engineering so I can make conscious and informed decisions about how to solve those problems. That's why I started researching Jamstack. I had heard that it was an interesting approach to building web apps that was changing how programmers thought about the roles of front-end and back-end coding. Now, as a full-stack dev, the veil between those two worlds is very important to me, so I couldn't resist checking this out. So now I've built a couple small Jamstack apps, and I really like the things turned out. And so now I'm here trying to convince you that maybe it's time to reevaluate the roles of front-end and back-end development. So about that Jamstack. The Jamstack is a methodology for building web apps that is based on client-side JavaScript, reusable APIs, and pre-built markup, J-A-M. And when I talk about JavaScript, I mean client-side JavaScript. No prescribed framework, it could even be vanilla JS. You know, many of the modern front-end frameworks like React or Angular have a server-side build component, and that's totally fine. But the output of that build process needs to be a client-side website that you can publish as a static site. When I say APIs, I'm talking about any server-side processes or persistence that you need, need to be abstracted away into an API that can be called from your JavaScript, either at runtime via something like a fetch, or even better at build time. Even server-side code that you own needs to be treated as if it were a third-party service. And finally, markup. The idea here is to keep your content completely decoupled from your design. So talking about Jamstack, it's common for devs to use static site generators or build tools that will pull content from flat files or APIs at build time. That's totally fine, it's not cheating, as long as you can publish the output of your build step as a static website. Okay, so JavaScript, APIs, and markup. That just kind of sounds like a basic website. If anything, it sounds like a step back in time to when dinosaurs like GeoCities ruled the internet. But just bear with me a little longer so we can talk about the benefits of build time rendering. So we've talked about the jam, but where does the stack come in? Well, there kind of isn't one. When I think of a technology stack, I think of a combination of complementary technologies that work well together. Things like LAMP stack or MEAN or Microsoft stack. Jamstack isn't so rigidly defined, it's much less prescriptive. It's really just a set of best practices for building decoupled front-end websites with a heavy emphasis on build time rendering. I've got a list of best practices up on the screen here, but all of these best practices really revolve around two core concepts. Deploying decoupled static websites that can be hosted on a CDN and build time rendering. Now when I say build time rendering, I'm talking about fetching all the data that you can when you're building your application for deployment. I'm talking about querying your database, services, or file systems up front. This works great when you have data that doesn't change often. Take, for instance, a content-heavy site where posts are often published once but read bazillions of times, like, a, say, a WordPress. Static site generators really shine at this, and traditional front-end frameworks like Angular and React are pushing towards this frontier with things like Angular AOT or React Prepack. So if you can push that work up front, that means you only have to do that work once. But what if your data does change often? Most data doesn't change often, but some does and some data just needs to be real time. There's nothing wrong with that. You just won't be able to leverage the benefits of build time rendering for those data points. If your application relies heavily on real time data, then it's probably not a great candidate for Jamstack. However, many applications only need a small percentage of their data in real time. There's nothing wrong with this, fetching the data you need in real time can, you can still leverage build time rendering for the data that doesn't need to change as often. E-commerce web apps are actually a really common use case for Jamstack applications. You just fetch the real-time data you need at runtime. Blogs and CMS are also common use cases. You just fetch the comments at real time. 
And one of the biggest benefits of build time rendering is that you can publish your results to a content delivery network, also known as a CDN. This means that people all over the world can access copies of your static files from the locations that are physically closer to them. Without a CDN, your data has to travel a lot farther. CDNs mean faster load times for your user, and they're also highly resilient and offer great protection against denial of service attacks. The only way to beat CDN really is note hosting since they offer the best performance, scalability, security, and pricing. It's great for devs, it's great for users, it's perfect for side projects where you can often get a CDN for free. And Google loves it because it's fast and jives nicely with progressive web apps. So uh, that's essentially what Jamstack is. It's a set of best practices for building decoupled front ends with a heavy emphasis on build time rendering. It gives us a name to refer to a subset of static sites that have these particular features and benefits. So, okay, uh, build time rendering is nice and CDN hosting is fantastic, but neither of these are really new concepts. Why are we talking about this in 2019? So I'm arguing that we've hit critical mass. Jamstack works because the tools and cloudy services that we use to build apps have multiplied and matured so that web developers could focus less on the boring things that we expect as consumers from all web apps like performance, scalability, security, uh, HTTPS, and we get to spend more time and energy on our problem domain, things that make our solutions unique. This makes us more efficient and it frees us up to be more creative. All right, so let's take a quick peek at how some of these tools and services can fit together. Now, Jamstack doesn't require any specific tools or services. This just happens to be my preference for building static sites. So in this example, I'm using Gatsby as my static site generator, which uses React for server-side includes and templating. It has a rich plugin ecosystem for ETL, and it uses GraphQL as an API slash isolation layer between my design and my data. I use Netlify for uh, just about everything else. It's a continuous integration and deployment pipeline as well as a CDN. It uses Let's Encrypt for HTTPS. It's basically just a checkbox for me. Uh, it's, it's totally free. They do offer uh, upsells uh, for, for running and managing uh, serverless functions as well as like authorization and a few other things. And I host my code in GitHub. So on to the code. Alrighty, so this is the simple Jamstack app running in Gatsby's development mode. Development mode gives me some nice development features like hot reloading for the UI, a GraphQL for an API layer, and it prevents Gatsby from trying to materialize all my data every time I make a change. This site is pretty basic. As you can see, I have a preference for the back end for sure, but I also want to keep things simple for demonstration purposes. Now, the idea behind this site is basically to let people browse for technical conferences. So we're looking at the home page now, and it's got a simple blog style content block up top. If we go into that, we can see it's got some content and uh, it's using discuss to fetch comments in real time. And if we go back, it's also got a, a bunch of links to conferences and you can click on one of these to get more details, like say, Orlando CoCam. And uh, let's take a look at the code behind this. And here's the file behind that homepage. Now, if you're not familiar with React and JSX templates, then this probably looks pretty crazy to you. Uh, but if you focus on the, the rendering parts below, you'll see it's just kind of standard client-side templating and rendering, and it's actually really similar to uh, server-side rendering. And if we scroll down a little bit further, you can see where I'm querying the data from my GraphQL endpoint. Gatsby queries this data from GraphQL when I'm running in development mode, and it queries GraphQL when I publish. However, the results of my publish are just static files that I can throw up on a CDN, and we can do that because Gatsby goes out and runs all my GraphQL queries and saves the output to static files. I don't need to publish a GraphQL endpoint because everything is done at build time. So you can't really tell here aside from the little giveaway in the, uh, in the query, but I'm pulling this data from Postgres and this data from disk. Uh, both ways are kind of written consistently somewhat thanks to GraphQL. If we take a look at that welcome file, See, it's kind of like a basic markdown file, except that uh, I've got some stuff up here at the top, some metadata, and I've got a couple plugins that make it easy for me to pull stuff from disk, and also uh, pulling stuff from Postgres, and even doing some metadata processing 
like we see at the top of the file here. So if we go over to my plugin configuration, I don't want to get into the details of Gatsby because it's a tool that happens to be good at making Jamstack apps, but it's far from the only one. And there are a lot of moving parts to Gatsby, and so I don't want to get too hung up. It's really big. But I do want to emphasize that using a modern static site generator like Gatsby gives you a huge leg up. For example, Gatsby has a rich plugin ecosystem. So I was able to find a couple plugins that saved me a lot of drudge work, and we can see those plugins configured here. I've got source plugins, which are responsible for fetching data and exposing that data through GraphQL to my website. I've got some transform plugins down here too, which are responsible for doing things like uh, parsing the metadata out of that markdown file that we saw. And uh, there's another one for uh, converting text data to JSON objects. Uh, by the way, did you notice that I'm pulling environment variables up here? You can't do something like that in a static file, but Gatsby has a server-side build that manages the plumbing so that those environment variables get rendered into our static files at build time. So uh, let's go check out our API layer. When you're running Gatsby in development mode, it spins up a tool called Graphical. Get it GraphIQL, Graphical, and you can use that to work with your data outside of the application. For example, I can see all the files that my plugin exposed. Uh, that's pretty boring though. You can see there isn't a whole lot of information available for me uh, for those files. And that's because the file plugins are only responsible for making my specified file information available via API. So it can call that from the front end or it can call that from other plugins. So let's take a look at one of those transform plugins that actually uses the data provided from this file plugin. All right, so this is the plugin that's responsible for parsing Markdown. And remember I mentioned that, uh, that metadata at the top of that Markdown file. You can see that's uh, very easily accessible. I can also see the raw Markdown that was in the file as well as the HTML that was generated from it. And all of this is available to either other plugins and also the website. Now I'm going to query the database. And the way I write the GraphQL code is very similar. There we go. I just ran out and uh, executed a query on my database. And the code that I wrote here is very similar to the, you know, the code or the, the query that I wrote for uh, the other plugins. And that's because GraphQL gives me a consistent API layer and even though GraphQL isn't a Jamstack requirement, it works out pretty well because it provides that abstraction layer that helps keep my front end isolated and decoupled from changes on the back end. This makes it so I can keep working at a, a higher level and I don't have to worry about recursively parsing JSON files or whatever because I can just kind of configure my plugins to do that kind of boring work for me. And I can focus on the things that me, a, a human, is better at, like solving business problems or coming up with a, you know, cool SVG animations or whatever. All right, now let's run a build and see what we get. And uh, you can see the basic outlines of the steps uh, here. It's pretty cool to see. But the end result of this build is that I get a bunch of HTML files which are nice. So if you directly go hit one of these files in a browser, it's going to immediately load. Google loves that. Also, if we scroll way down to the static folder, you can see that I've got uh, essentially like a you know hash table on disk of uh, data that can be fetched from my website at runtime via you know XHR AJAX, so that uh, we don't have to do a whole repaint of the screen. And I don't really know how that works internally. I haven't looked too closely to see like how it decides when to use a page or when it decides to use the data, but it's, I think it's pretty, pretty nifty to have those options and I assume it's doing smart things with it. So now I can take these static files and I can throw them up on a CDN for free, uh, which lets me, you know, that best in class performance, scalability, price and security. And that's what I've done at findtech.events. So that's it for the demo. All right, so now let's talk about some of the downsides. I don't think that Jamstack is appropriate for every application, uh, maybe not even most of them. Uh, I came up with a couple things that I thought might be rough for it. 
mainly dealing with uh, big data analytics type sites that uh, have a heavy emphasis on real-time data, uh, real-time systems. And also, um, it's kind of an uh, awkward experience for non-developer interactions, by which I mean if you've got, like, um, say, a marketing department uh, owning the content of a site, and you've got to build some sort of admin tool for that that's completely decoupled from your front end. And so it's something actually that you have to do and you have to manage that relationship. And uh, there are endless CV CMSs and things that kind of uh, work to solve that problem. But I just thought it was kind of awkward, so I wanted to list it here. All right, so we're just about done here, but um, I do think that this is probably the most important screen in the whole presentation. I don't know if we'll be talking about Jamstack in a few years. I, I do think we'll see more and more front-end frameworks pushing towards build-time rendering. I think that just makes sense. And this is an important trend for back-end developers to watch because build-time rendering changes the responsibilities of the back-end. You no longer need a back-end framework to do server-side rendering. This can be done better in the front end and at build time. So why shouldn't the front end own all of the HTML rendering? It's closer to the browser, it's closer to the user, it's good at it. The back end is losing ground here. It's losing responsibilities to the front end. And I'm betting that the concepts behind Jamstack will continue to gain popularity. And that popularity is going to be taken away from mature entrenched technologies that uh, you know some of which are listed on the screen here. And uh, I am arguing that this is a good thing. It doesn't mean these frameworks are going away, it's just they're losing part of the responsibility, the things that they're supposed to do. And so it frees them up to focus more on the API layer. And I think that's a good thing. So uh, researching the Jamstack has changed how I view the roles of front-end and back-end coding, and it's changed how I'm investing my development time now in 2019. I no longer care as much, for example, uh, you know, if PHP has a better rendering experience than Flask, uh, I'm going to favor the tools that make for better APIs. And so, uh, in short, Jamstack is a set of best practices for building decoupled front ends with a heavy emphasis on build time rendering. It's quickly gaining popularity because the managed services and front end tooling have reached a tipping point where it's now easy to make great static sites at build time. And I'm betting that the front end and back end responsibilities are shifting to focus more on build time rendering and APIs. And if you like this talk, uh, check out Coding Blocks podcast on YouTube or uh, you know subscribe to this channel. We don't do guest interviews. We try to focus on real dev talk like um, you know how the front end and back end roles are changing over time. So if you are interested in this sort of thing, then give us a listen. Thank you.